Uh, I'm continuing on with our dark sayings. Uh, we took a little break last week to, to hit that modalist doctrine <laughs> right between the eyes. And, and so we're kind of back with this dark sayings uh, series. And I, I like it personally. Uh, but one I wanted to hit uh, because I've been, I was seeing some Zionist stuff on, online and just seeing some people like perpetuating this, this, this stupid doctrine. I want to talk about the, par the, the fig tree parables. Now, I say that because this isn't the only one. There's actually another parable dealing with a fig tree. But this is the one that the Zionists go to. And it, in verse 28 there is where we see uh, this parable. So, obviously this whole chapter is about end times prophecy. And so they, they latch onto this parable. And they, they'll just come out and say this parable of this fig tree. This is when Israel became... A state back in 1948 or 47 now they're saying 48 uh, but this is where the the fig tree budded and that that represents when Israel became a nation again in 1948 and that basically Jesus is going to come back within that generation and and they get into this whole there's a peace treaty made with Israel and all this other weird stuff okay that's not in the Bible uh, the only thing I can uh, find even that would even be remotely close to that is in Daniel where it talks about how the Antichrist is going to make a league with somebody and all this other stuff. And it's like, yeah, that doesn't line up with anything they're trying to say. But, uh, but in Matthew, thir or Matthew, Matthew 24 and Mark 13, and also in Luke 21, we see this parable of the fig tree. And so, uh, and notice it says a parable of the fig tree. It doesn't say the parable of the fig tree because there's actually another parable that we're going to talk about. But I figured I'd hit this one first because this is when you hear the parable of the fig tree, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about this one that's dealing with end times prophecy. But they say it's dealing with the nation of Israel, that the fig tree represents the nation of Israel, and that it's when Israel becomes a nation and it's budding, it's bringing forth its leaves. It's when, it, you notice when it says, when her branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So, obviously, everything about that with Israel and becoming a nation is a bunch of hogwash. Okay, that's not anywhere close to what this is teaching. Actually, if you just read up a couple verses or a few verses, and then you compare this to the parallel passage in Revelation 6. Although, this is perpetuated by a lot of false teachers that are Zionists, but also by a bunch of Zionist pre-tribbers. And these Zionist pre-tribbers, they just want to hold on to the Jewish state, and the, they want to worship the Jews for some reason. And they hold on to this doctrine. So they don't think that Revelation 6 parallels with Matthew 24, Mark 13, or Luke 21, even though it fits like a glove. But uh, go up a, a few verses... In Mark 13, in verse 24 and 25, we'll see exactly what this parable of the fig tree, why he's saying, you know, here, you know, now learn the parable of the fig tree. Because he's pointing you back to something. He's actually pointing you back to something and forward to something because there's something in the Old Testament dealing with this, and there's something in the New Testament dealing with this, and it's talking about the same event. But notice what it says in Mark 13, verse 24. It says, But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. So that's what was just talked about before it says, Now learn the parable of the fig tree, because all this happens, Jesus comes in the clouds. We'll go to Revelation chapter 6, because we know... That the sun and moon being darkened is a marker. And that's throughout, I'm not, I'm not going to preach on the whole day of the Lord coming after the sun and moon are darkened because that's very clear. We've already gone through that before. But I want to focus on the stars of heaven are falling. So we see the sun and moon are darkened, the stars of heaven are falling. When this happens, when does that happen? Immediately after the tribulation. Amen. And then what happens after that? Jesus comes in the clouds. And so... In Revelation chapter 6, and verse 12 is where we see the opening of the sixth seal. And so in verse 12 it says, And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now, a logical thinker here would say, 
okay, in Revelation 6, it's likening the stars falling from heaven with a fig tree and the figs falling from a fig tree. And what was the thing that it talked about right before it talks about the parable of the fig tree? The sun and moon are darkened, the stars are falling from heaven, and Jesus is coming in the clouds. And it says, now learn the parable of the fig tree. Why is he saying this? Because he's saying, when you, see, why, when you, when you go back to Mark 13, when you go back to Mark 13, it says, so in verse 29, It's, it's telling you, okay, here's the parable of the fig tree, when it put it forth its leaves, and it says in verse 29, So ye in like manner, when ye see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. What? When you see what come to pass? When the sun and moon are darkened, and the stars are falling from heaven. When you see that come to pass, know that it's at the doors. There's no doubt. It's at the doors. It's coming now because... This is, all, this is going down. I mean, you had the sun and moon dark and the stars are falling from heaven. Jesus is coming. It's at the doors. And notice what it says in verse 30. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So we, we see that. What's he saying? When you see the sun and moon darkened and when you see the stars from, fall from heaven... That generation will not pass until Jesus comes in the clouds. That's what that's saying. It's just a clear presentation. And, and why is it saying, now learn a parable of the fig tree? Because, guess what? This was mentioned in the Old Testament. He's pointing them back. Didn't he just point them back to Daniel the prophet? When it says, when you shall see the abomination desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, whosoever readeth, let him understand. And now he's saying, okay, then when this happens, now you know, learn the parable of the fig tree. Why? Because he mentions this. Go to Isaiah 34. Isaiah 34. Remember, when in the Bible, a lot of times, God is using marker phrases and verses to take you back to another passage to see what's going on, to explain something else. So Isaiah 34. That sun is just coming through, isn't it? <laughs> That daylight savings time is getting you right now. <laughs> so, uh, but the, in Isaiah 34 and verse 4, notice what it says. So we, and we, we saw in Mark 13 that the stars are going to fall from heaven. It, it, going into this parable of the fig tree. In Revelation 6.13 it says, And stars, shall, uh, stars of heaven uh, fall into the earth, and as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs. That's what it says in verse 4 of Isaiah 34. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. Sound familiar? And all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. It couldn't be any clearer. And if you think, well, is this talking about the day of the Lord? Well, in verse 8 it says, For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. So we're clearly talking about the day of the Lord, but we saw both those elements in Revelation chapter 6 of the, the, the stars falling from heaven like the untimely figs. And what also did we see that's, that's mentioned in this one verse? That the heavens are going to be rolled together as a scroll. So all that fits like a glove. So when you see, now learn a parable of the fig tree, why is he saying that? Because when you see that, when you see the stars falling from heaven and the, and the heavens departing as a scroll, then there's no question Jesus is coming soon. There's no question it's at the doors. There's no question that there's not going to be another generation after that's, that's going to live because this is going to happen now. And so that's what he's saying. And what they say with this is they say, well, the budding of the fig tree... It doesn't say anything about budding of the fig tree. I hate when they use word. First of all, if you're going to use a passage in the Bible, at least quote it correctly. And so, it says when when the when it says the branch is yet tender. So at least say the tender fig tree. I don't know. At least be semi biblical when you're saying something about some stupidity. But but they they say the budding of the fig tree. This is when in 1948 or you know 47. And they say, well, this is when Israel became a nation. Now, why I say that, 47, 48? Because there's dispute as far as, like, when did they actually become a state? Well, last year, because you know that this year, if it's 1948, what, what is that now, 2018? That's 70 years, okay? So it's the 70-year anniversary of them becoming a, a, a state or whatever, becoming a country. And uh, 
So last year they had some big to do about the fact that this is like an anniversary, 70 years from 1947. Well, nothing happened. So guess what? Now it's like, well, it's 1948 really is when it really went into, you know, they, they signed it in 1947, but 1948 is when they really became a country or when it was recognized, okay? You don't need to know any of this information, okay? But I'm just telling you this because this is what they say. And, but here's the thing. It says that this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Since when is 70 years a generation? Someone needs to tell these Zionists that a generation is not how long people live. Amen. Okay? A generation is dealing with how, how old you are when you, when you have children. Okay? And today, I don't see many 70-year-olds having children. I'm just going to be honest with you. I mean, obviously, it happened with, with Sarah. She was 90. That was a miracle, though. So I'm not, saying, I'm not putting it past God that he couldn't do that. But that's not the norm. Most people are having children at 20, 30, 40, you know, those ranges. And obviously, you have people that have them older or younger, stuff like that. But I would say 30 would be a safe bet as far as what a generation is, you know, somewhere around there. So this whole idea of, well, it's this, this generation is not going to pass, so this year he's coming in the clouds or something stupid like that. Here's the thing. Jesus is not going to come back until the man of sin, the son of perdition, is revealed. And that's not, and, you know, we're not in that yet. We're not even into where we're in world wars yet. Okay, so we still have time to when this is going to happen. And so this whole idea, you know, I don't believe we're even into the, the, the beginning stages of the tribulation yet. Because I, I think it's going to be a lot worse. I think we're going to be dealing with pestilence, famines, and we're going to have world, world wars and all this other stuff. A fourth of the world's going to die. Think about that. A fourth of the world's going to die before the abomination desolation. Don't, don't you think it's going to be something you're probably going to think, realize or see? Okay, so this whole idea of, oh, he's going to come back this year, no, just not going to happen. But they, they, they go to this, and, and if you're just reading your Bible, if you're just reading for what it says, would you have come up with that? Would you have come up with something about, like, Israel becoming a state again, or this weird stuff about, well, when they become a state in that generation, you know, this is when all this stuff's going to go down. I mean, none of that would make sense. But if you're just reading your Bible and you're just using Scripture to compare Scripture, do you see how when you compare that to Revelation 6, it makes perfect sense what that's talking about? That the parable of the fig tree is just talking about the fact that the stars are going to fall from heaven. And when you see that happen, you know that it's nigh. Now, if you saw the sun and moon darken and the stars falling from heaven, wouldn't you say, I think it's pretty close. <laughs> I think we're getting there, right? Because you've already saw the abomination desolation, right? And you see that we're in great tribulation. The sun and moon are darkened. That means that Jesus is coming now. You know, it's, it's soon. If not that day, he's coming. And so that's what that's saying. That's why it's saying this generation shall not pass away until all these things. It says when you see these things. When you see what? Israel become a state? Now, it's saying when you see the sun and moon darken, the stars falling from heaven, and it's giving you an example of a tree, and as far as the, the fig tree and all this stuff, it's giving you an example because you know that summer is nigh. And it, what it's talking about, because what is the end of the world usually likened to? It's likened to the harvest. And so it's just giving you an idea that, hey, I may not know when Jesus is exactly going to come, but I'll tell you one thing, it's going to happen after summer, you know, if he's coming in the harvest. So there's just certain things you know about the seasons. You know that this is, the summer is nigh, the harvest is coming, it's about to happen. That's why it's just giving you an example of just a tree in general. When you see a tree starting to bud forth, you're like, hey, it's about time. It's about time for that fruit to start. And it's just giving you that, that, that example, that allegory of what the end times are like. Because obviously the harvest is what we're, when you think of end times, what do you think of? You think of the harvest. You think of night. You think of, you know, just a lot of different pictures of what end times would represent. So anyway, that's the parable of the fig tree in dealing with end times prophecy. But one they dare not talk about is the other parable of the fig tree. Go to Luke chapter 13. There's actually another parable of the fig tree. But they probably don't want to go too deep into this one. Because it may destroy their Zionist doctrine. I find it ironic that they're always bringing up the parable of the fig tree. And this other parable of the fig tree just destroys Zionism. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite amusing. 
So that's why I say this is the fig tree parables, because there's actually two different parables dealing with a fig tree. Now this one, I believe no doubt is talking about the nation of Israel. And we're going to get into that and talk about this, because Jesus actually later on answers what happens to this fig tree. Okay, so in Luke chapter 13, he just got done. This is the repent ye or show all likewise perish chapter. Okay, so this, this is where he talks, and this is, I'm, I'm saying that because people with, that are repenting of sins crowd, they're always like, you know, Luke 13, it says repent of your sins, although it never says that. Um, so he's ripping on uh, Israel and saying, you know, these people did this. Do you think that they were worse sinners than others, the Galileans and all this other stuff? And it says, but I say unto you, except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. So he's basically rebuking them, saying, hey, they were sinners, but you need to, to get right, right? But in Luke 13, in verse 6, is where we get into a parable, because he's rebuking it, the Israelites, and so he gives them a parable. And notice what it says in verse 6. He says, he spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it, and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that, Thou shalt cut it down. What's interesting about this parable is that it says, notice the time frame as far as how, how long he was, he's been coming seeking fruit on this fig tree. In verse 7, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. How long was Jesus' ministry? About three years. Three and a half, you know, depending on how you look at it. You know, somewhere around there. About three years. And notice what it says, in verse 8, it says, Lord, let it alone this year also. So it's within that, th they're in the third year, it sounds like. And he's saying, let it alone this year also. I'll, I'll dig about it and dung it. And he's saying, if it doesn't bear fruit, or if it bears fruit, well, but if not, we'll cut it down. So it's interesting that he gives that time frame of three years, because how long was Jesus on the earth, you know, with, it, with his ministry, where it says he came unto his own, as his own received them not. Go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, because we're going to see that this isn't just in the corner here where it's talking about this tree and cutting down this tree, because it's talking about the fact that they're rejecting the Christ. They're rejecting the Messiah, and they're going to, it's, they're going to be rooted up. And so, we already know that to be true. We already know that Israel was rejected. Anybody that's a, that's a Bible-believing Christian that actually cares about what the Bible says and not just some stupid doctrine that they're trying to perpetuate. Anybody that's just honestly reading the Bible will see that Israel was rejected. Israel in the Old Testament was done away. We're going to talk about that. But this parable of this fig tree, or the barren fig tree, this is definitely talking about Israel. But they dare not look at this one, because this would go completely against their Zionist doctrines. But Matthew 3, this, we're talking about John the Baptist here. He's preaching. And he's, he's ripping face against these uh, Pharisees and Sadducees in verse 7 there. So Matthew 3, verse 7, it says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That's a, quite a hard sermon he's preaching against them. But he's saying, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And he's talking about you know, raising up children. So we know what's the fruits he's talking about. The fact that they're not winning anybody. You know, the, the nation as a whole was not bringing forth fruit. They were failing as God's nation to bring forth fruit. And you know what? There's a lot of Baptist churches that are like that too. And the axe is being, lay, is being uh, laid unto the root of these Baptist churches because and th they're not soul winning, they're not bearing fruit, and they're being cast into the fire, so to speak, because they're closing their doors. 
What, what did Jesus say about Ephesus when they lost their first love? It says, repent ye or I'll come and take the candlestick away from you. And what is the candlestick? The church. The fact that they're a legitimate church. So that's another sermon for another day. But we also know that trees are, are mentioned when we're dealing with false prophets. Right? So what you'll find in the Bible is that trees will, will sometimes be dealing with a whole nation. Like with this parable and, and with Israel and stuff like that. But it can also be dealing with people, in general, like individual people, like individual false prophets. We'll see, and go to Matthew chapter 7. But in, in Jude, you know, we, we also know where it says, Trees whose fruit wither, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Talking about uh, these, these false prophets that have crept in on the wares uh, and all that stuff. So we know that false prophets, we'll see in Matthew 7 as well, are dealing with trees. But you also see, if you look at Re uh, Romans chapter 11, branches of the, the olive tree is likened unto nations. Because we were likening it to the Gentiles being grafted in and Israel was, was broken off, remember? But then you also see branches dealing with saved people or just individuals. When you look at John chapter 15, when you're dealing with the fact that, you know, if, if you're bringing forth fruit, he's going to purge you. But if you don't bring forth fruit, you're going to be you're going to be cast into the fire. So you see, you can't take well. A tree always represents this because sometimes it's dealing with a whole nation. Sometimes it's dealing with a person individually. Same with the branches. Sometimes the branches are talking about a whole nation and group of people, and sometimes the branch itself is just talking about an individual person. Does that make sense? So you got to be careful when you're looking at those things. They don't always just like fit like this one uh, you know definition of whatever that tree or branch or whatever it's talking about. It has to be in context with what you're talking about. But in Matthew chapter 7, there's a very famous passage dealing with false prophets in verse 15. It says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So this is a very famous passage dealing with fruits and dealing with a corrupt tree and a good tree. But you can see how it's, it's dealing with the fruits. If it's not bringing forth fruit, it's hewn down and cast into the fire, period. And so, when, when you're dealing with a good prophet and a false prophet, it's just dealing with the fact that, okay, this one's, this one's a saved prophet, this one's an unsaved false prophet, right? So, this, this list here of Matthew 7, I don't believe, is dealing with every single person on, in the spectrum of either unsaved or saved. Because there's a lot of saved people that don't go soul winning, and there's a lot of unsaved people that don't go preaching a false gospel. Does that make sense? So what we're dealing with with these trees bringing forth good fruit and, and, and corrupt trees bringing forth evil fruit, you're dealing with a, a more confined group of unsaved people and saved people. Does that make sense? And so anyway, I just want you to see here that the tree bringing forth fruit is a lot of times representing you know, a false prophet or dealing with a nation. In this case, a nation that's not bringing forth fruit. John the Baptist rebuked him for that, and he says the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. And he said, why, you know, why, is it, why does that not matter that he's going to cut down that tree? Because God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Because he actually has someone, another nation that he's going to use. Okay, But this is a great parable to show, hey, he gave him a chance. Because it doesn't say here that he cut, him, cut down the tree. Right? It just says, hey, leave it alone another year. This year also, you know, dig about it, dung it, right, fertilize it, and if it bears fruit, well, if it doesn't, cut it down. Now we we'll see the end of the story because, you know, actually Jesus will answer what happens to that fig tree, but in that parable itself, it doesn't tell you the end game. It doesn't tell you what exactly happened to that fig tree. You may wonder, you know, I wonder if that tree bear fruit, you know. I wonder if it actually did start bringing forth fruit or if, if they actually cut it down. Well, I want to first show you that, uh, go to Isaiah 5, that, that Israel is likened unto a vineyard and a fig tree in the Old Testament. More so the, the, more so the vineyard, but in that parable, do you remember where was the fig tree? 
Where was the fig tree growing? It says, uh, I'm, I lost my page here. Uh, it says, he had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. So Matt, uh, Isaiah 5, I just wanted to show you verse 7 there. And this whole chapter is dealing with the vineyard. So if you want a homework assignment to read about the vineyard of the Lord and, and, and just uh, him dealing with Israel. But this verse clearly states it. Verse 7 it says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Plain as day. And the, the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold oppression. For righteousness, but behold a cry. So obviously he's rebuking Israel here in Isaiah 5. But notice the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is what? The house of Israel. Now go to Jeremiah 7. I just want in Jeremiah 7 at the beginning, I just want you to first of all see who he's, who's the Lord's talking to because we're going to see in Jeremiah 8 uh, where he's comparing Israel to uh, a fig tree just like we're seeing in this parable. So we see that he, he likens Israel to a vineyard. We see in the parable that, it was, that the fig tree was in the vineyard, right? And, it, and obviously we're going to see that he has a parable of a vineyard that's clearly talking about Israel later on. Um, but in Jeremiah 7, I just want you to see in these first three verses that he's talking, that the Lord is talking, because Jeremiah 7, when it goes straight into 8, okay? So it's just one continuous uh, thought and one continuous uh, thing that's being preached to Israel. But I want you to see in 7 who he's talking to. It says, the word, of, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. So, I, so who's he talking to? He's talking to Judah. Now, if you know Jeremiah, he's, he's preaching to Judah. Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, has already been taken out. And Judah, he's preaching against them and, and trying to get them to come around because Babylon's about to take them out. Now, in verse, uh, chapter 8 and verse 13, notice what it says. Chapter 8, Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 13, it says, I will surely consume them, saith the Lord. There shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall fade, and the things that I have given them shall pass away from them. So this is clearly talking about Judah and talking about Israel. And, and he's saying that there's not going to be any grapes and there's not going to be any figs. No fruit. He's taking it all away. And so we see that this isn't unprecedented, that the fig tree would represent Israel or that a vineyard would, re would represent Israel, because we see that in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, he's giving parables about a fig tree, and then he goes into a parable about a vineyard. Now, in uh, Matthew chapter 21, that's where the parable of... Back, there's two back-to-back -back parables dealing with vineyards. And right before he gets into those parables, there's something that happens. It's not a parable. It's something that Jesus literally did. So go to Matthew chapter 21, verse 18. I believe this is answering what happened to that fig tree. Matthew 21 and verse 18. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when his disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? There's your answer to what happened to that fig tree. You know, he, he waited on that thing for three years. No fruit, no fruit, no fruit. Every time he came to it, no fruit. Jesus comes up to this fig tree. There's no fruit on it. And he said, you, you may say, man, he was angry that day. He must have been really hangry. You know, like... To come up to this fig tree and just be like, there's no figs on it, you're done. You're going to be cursed, right? But I believe it's an answer to a, the parable, you know, that we saw in Luke chapter 13. And if actually you know the course of events, if you're looking at Luke 13, that ha that, he spoke that parable before he gets into this. Right where we're at in Matthew 21 is right before the Olivet Discourse and right before he's going to the cross. I mean, we're getting down to the very end of things when we're dealing with these parables that he's speaking here or this, this, this story. 
But in Mark, Mark it says the same thing, Mark, Mark 11. But again, it's in the same timeline. But I want you to see just some different wording when you're dealing with it. So this actually happened. This is what he did. He cursed this fig tree and it withered away. In Mark 11 and verse 12, it says, And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree. I'm sorry, in verse 20. I'm sorry, I skipped down there. Verse 20. So he goes into a different story. They come back out of this area, and then they come and see this fig tree. So in verse 20, it says, And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. Is it a coincidence that this parable, this, or not this parable, but when he curses this fig tree and it withers away and says, let there no, be no more fruit on thee forever, that he goes into this tour de force of parables against Israel in this vineyard and says, the kingdom of God is taken away from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Do you think that's a coincidence? Or do you think that lines up hand in glove? Because that's exactly what it goes into. If you go down, so in Mark, or I mean in Matthew 30, uh, 21, in verse you know, 18 through 20, we see where he curses this fig tree. It withers away. He says, he says, let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. That's a strong thing to say. And then it, presently the, tree, the fig tree withered away. And they marveled saying, how soon is the fig tree withered away? And then you go down to verse 28, and he goes into this parable of these two sons going into the vineyard. Now, I, I don't want to go into this parable, like I don't want to go into all the details of this parable, um, but I do just want to show you that it's interesting that it goes into two different parables about a vineyard. We see that when we had the other parable, the fig tree, or was the fig tree in the vineyard? And it didn't bring forth fruit. And he was saying, you know, if it doesn't bring forth fruit, we're going to cut it down. And so in Matthew 21 and verse 28 there, notice what it says. It says, but what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, likewise, and he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. So we see this parable. I'm not going into all the details on, on the parable of the two sons. But one said, I'm gonna, I'll go, but he didn't go. The other one said, I'm not going to, but he did. So obviously the parable is talking about the fact that it doesn't matter. It, you know, it's not what you say, but what you do. right? And so you can, you can talk a big talk, but if you don't do it, then it doesn't matter. And you know, it, it's more about what you do, your actions. But... As you go on down after that parable, we get into another parable about a vineyard. Now, this is a very famous parable. And this is clearly talking about the children of Israel. So, in Matthew 21 and verse 33, you're like, oh, we're talking about the parable of the vineyard now. Well, it's all interlocking. Like, all these parables, Jesus is going through a, basically a... All these parables, when you look at Matthew 20, Matthew 21, 22, 23, he is just ripping face against Israel. Okay? I could just, they're all intertwined. They're all linked. He's just giving different avenues of how to explain how he's done with Israel and he's going on to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. But this one's crystal clear that that's what's going on. But in Matthew 21, verse 33, it says, Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. Same thing, dealing with the parable of the fig tree, the barren fig tree, what was he trying to, he came to it looking for fruit. And for three years he looked for fruit on this thing. And in this case, he's saying, hey, I, I'm sending servants to go find, you know, 
receive the fruits of this this vineyard. And if you know the story, I don't I, I don't want to go through the whole story of this, but he sends servants, they beat some, he kills some, they kill other ones. And obviously this is showing the whole timeline of Israel, right? The fact that, oh Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. So it's a parallel to the fact that he's been sending them prophets for, you know, since the beginning of them being a nation. And they've been killing them, killing them, you know, stoning them, putting them in the prison, and all this stuff. And then eventually he sends his own his 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 beloved son. And he's like, they'll reverence him. What they do to Jesus, they killed him. And isn't that what they do in this story? They killed the son. And notice in verse 42. So there's other places in, in, in Mark where it talks about this parable. And, you know, so you can look at the other parallel uh, passages to this parable of the vineyard. But notice what it says in verse 42. It says, Jesus saith unto them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Now notice this. Notice verse 45. And if you don't mind underlining lining things in your Bible, notice what it says. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. It's funny that these blind Pharisees, these blind Pharisees can see that these parables were against them, but Baptist pastors and all these, these pre-tribbers can't see it. Isn't that hilarious to you? Talk about the blind leading the blind. Even the blind Pharisees knew that this parable was against them. There is no doubt that this is talking about Israel and talking about their leaders that, that he's ripping their face off right here because they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. They wanted to kill him because of what he was speaking against them. And so... There's no doubt that this is talking about that. So when you deal with this fig tree, you're talking about this fig tree being withered away. What are you dealing with? You're dealing with the, the, the Old Testament is being done away. You know, in, in Exodus chapter 19, when he made a covenant with the nation of Israel, said that they would be a peculiar people and a peculiar treasure, that they would be his people and he would be their God. That was made off a condition that they would keep the commandments. We're not talking about salvation. We're not talking about how people go to heaven. It was based off them be, being that chosen generation, that, that holy nation was based off a condition that they were keeping the commandments of God and they broke the commandments. And he's saying, I came to you looking for fruit and I sent prophets unto you. You killed the prophets. You stoned the prophets. You sent them away shamefully. I sent my son and you killed my son. The kingdom of God is taken away from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Jesus said unto the fig tree, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. 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 That fig tree is not going to bud again. The nation of Israel is done. As far as the physical nation of Israel, it's completely gone. It's withered away. Jesus said that no fruit is going to grow on it forever. Amen. Why do you think he was so harsh when he said that to that fig tree? Because he was making a point. He was making a point of what that represented. And so, and obviously that's referencing back to the parable that he was saying about the fig tree that he came to for three years, looking for fruit on it, and didn't find any. John the Baptist said, Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance, and the axe is laid to the root of the tree. And the tree that doesn't bring forth good fruit is going to be hewn down and cast into the fire. That's exactly what happened with Israel. That's exactly what would happen with the Old Testament. And it just fits like a glove. So we see that, that, in, in, in that when, when he cursed that tree, notice in verse 19, so you're in Matthew 21, verse 19, it says, And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Notice how soon it was withered away. 
Because when did the Old Testament end? The moment Jesus died on the cross. And that was going to happen in a, in, a, in a short time here. That he was going to die on the cross when he said this. And so, this is clearly referencing the Old Testament being done away, the New Testament starting, and the Old Testament is done. There's no fruit coming from the Old Testament. This whole idea that the Old Testament's still around and the Jews are still following the Old Testament's a bunch of hogwash. The Old Testament is called old because it's done. It's old. So, and, and, but look at Hebrews chapter 8. With that in mind, when you're dealing with this fig tree that's, that's withered away, there's no fruit on it. Go to Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13. So the last verse there of the chapter. So Hebrews chapter 8 verse 13 Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, it says, And that he set the new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Talking about the Old Testament, it's ready to vanish away. And you say, well, it's still ready to vanish away. It hasn't vanished away yet, but it's still ready to vanish away. Well, we'll get to that. So go to Hebrews chapter 10, though. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9. It says, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, then he may establish the second. In order to, you know what he's saying there? In order to establish the second, he had to take away the first. First. Right? So, that's what he's saying. In order to establish the second, he had to take away the first. That means that they can't overlap. That's right. So the moment that Jesus died on the cross, the Old Testament ended... And the New Testament started. There's no space. There's no overlap. It's just boom. The Old Testament's done. The veil was rent from the top to the bottom when Jesus gave up the ghost. And it says that, that the, the, the Testament is after the death of the testator in Hebrews chapter 9. So the moment Jesus died, that New Testament started. And, what's, and, and you say, well, you know, I still think that well, it's ready to vanish away. We'll go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And there's no doubt that, that it's done. It's done. It was done back in Paul's day. And obviously, I believe it was done when Jesus died on the cross. But this is just the nail in the coffin in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11. We're talking about the Old Testament New Testament. If you, if you know this chapter... He's talking about the difference between the two. But it says in verse 11, it says, For that which is done away was glorious. Now, is that present tense or future tense? That's present tense. Is done away was glorious. Much more that which remaineth is glorious. Verse 12. Seeing then that we, we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. And if you have any doubt that we're not talking about the Old Testament, notice verse 14. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. There's no doubt that that the Old Testament, it is done away, it is abolished, it's clear. It's present tense, it's, it's gone. That's why when the fig tree, when it withered away, they said, how soon is it withered away? Because literally they had, they had days before the Old Testament was done. When he, when, he, when he cursed that fig tree, there was literally days before the Old Testament was abolished. Because he was going to the cross. He was going to, he was going to Calvary, and that's when you had the transition between the Old Testament and New Testament. And so, go to, you're in, are you still in Matthew chapter 21? Matthew chapter 21. You say, okay, well, the, the, the nation of Israel is, is, is withered away. It's done away with. So, what's this nation that he's bringing uh, forth the fruits thereof? You know, he's taking it away from the kingdom of God, away from Israel. But who's he giving it to? Well, I want you to see, first of all, in, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 21, verse 42. Again, you want to use 
these marker verses. You know, you want to see, okay, when he's talking about the kingdom of God taking it away from them and giving to the nation and bringing forth the fruits thereof, what scripture did he just quote before he said that? Well, in Matthew 21, verse 42, it says, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected the same as become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Notice, therefore. So he's quoting this verse from, from Isaiah, and he's quoting it saying, therefore, this is why the kingdom of God is taken away from you and get, bringing forth, or given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Well, go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Because it's quoted in 1 Peter chapter 2, and it actually goes exactly into what we're talking about with this nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. 1 Peter chapter 2. So the first parable of the fig tree that we saw is just clearly talking about a representation of the, the, the stars falling from heaven. Right? Just because, like, in one place a fig tree represents this, it doesn't mean it always represents that. There's cases where a branch can represent an unsaved nation. There's a case where a branch just represents a saved person that's not doing anything, or a saved person that is bringing forth fruit. And so trees can be good things, they can be bad things, you know, and so you've got to always look at context when you're looking at these things. So these two parables of the fig trees, I believe one's talking about the nation of Israel, but the other one isn't. It's just talking about, you know, a representation of, you know, things falling from a tree, <laughs> okay? You know, that's just, it's just giving you a picture, okay? But uh, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6, it says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. He that believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Sound familiar? Because that's what was quoted in Matthew 21. And notice in, uh, in verse uh, 8 there, we'll continue reading. And a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous night, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Here's your different nation. The holy nation, the royal priesthood, the chosen generation. And a lot of the stuff, the peculiar people, is, this is the stuff that he attributed to the nation, the physical nation of Israel. If you read Exodus chapter 19, before they got the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, this is the same exact language that's used for them, but that covenant has been done away with. But now the new covenant is dealing with that holy nation, but who's it dealing with? Everybody, every believer. Every believer, whether Jew or Gentile, in Christ, they're all one. There's no, there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek now. And now, we're a holy nation. All believers make up the holy nation. And it's not just a physical nation in a certain geographic location. It's just all believers. And he's saying that, and it's interesting because he's talking about the, the chief cornerstone. And it's just a marker to say, okay, hey, you know how Jesus was saying the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof? This is what he's talking about. He's talking about, you know, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We're talking about the Gentiles. We're talking about those that were not of Israel. But we know that the, the holy nation also does make up people that were of Israel, like Paul and like Peter, James, and John, like all the other people that believed that were in Israel, they all make up that nation, but now it's, it's not just the fact that, hey, you're of Israel, you're circumcised, you're keeping the feasts, and you're keeping the Sabbaths. That was the Old Testament. In the New Testament, now we can eat pig, we don't, keep, we don't have to keep the Sabbath, we're not doing all these feasts and new moons. Now it's different. Now we have the Holy Ghost indwelling us, and now it's all believers make up that holy nation. We're the holy nation that God said that he was giving the kingdom of God to to bring forth the fruits thereof. That's why in Galatians chapter 6 it says in verse 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be upon them, and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Because it doesn't have to do with circumcision anymore. 
Circumcision used to be, you know, kind of, if, hey, if you want to be a Jew, if you want to be an Israelite, get circumcised, keep the feast, keep the Sabbath. You know, you're of the holy nation now. Not for salvation, because that's always been by faith. But if you wanted to be a part of that holy nation and that chosen people of God that, that God was using to, to, to see his, his work done, then yeah, you had to be circumcised and do all this other stuff in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avail anything, but a new creature. And it says, and as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. We are the Israel of God. We're the holy nation. We're the peculiar people. We're the royal priesthood. And this parable of the fig tree, this barren parable of the fig tree, is just representing the last three years of Israel, the nation, where God recognized them as being his peculiar people and that, that nation being having the kingdom of God to where they were supposed to be preaching the gospel and doing all the works of God. He's just showing in that parable the last three years of them being barren to where he cuts them down. Right. And he literally spoke it. He didn't take an axe to that fig tree. He says, he just spoke to it and cursed it, and it straightway withered away. And they were marveling, saying, how soon is it withered away? How soon was the Old Testament done after he said that? Days. Days before it was done. And so... I thought that was an interesting, interesting parallel, and obviously we got into some other, you know, a little bit of other parables there. But the, the, the parable of the fig tree in, in Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21, people all want to go into some weird doctrines with that and some weird things with Israel and Zionism. Doesn't match up. I mean, anything that you're referencing with that, there's nothing in the Bible about that. There's nothing about a peace treaty. There's nothing about them becoming a state again or anything like that. That's all just their imagination. And these pre-tribbers pre have a wild imagination. But they dare not talk about the other one. Right? That's like the dirty little secret or something of the Bible. That other parable of the fig tree that they don't want to talk about. It's, it, it's funny because that one actually destroys what they're trying to teach with, with the other one. Amen. And so uh, the parable of the fig tree is a great parable. Both of them are. And they're both very easy to understand what they're talking about. And so, let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this evening and pray that you be with us as we go home. And that, Lord, as we uh, go into the work week, pray that you help us to get everything we need to get done. And Lord, help us to bring glory to your name. And Lord, we love you and pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.